Greetings, friends. Uh, the Western world has just kept its uh, Christmas. The Eastern world or East European world is going to keep its Christmas on January uh, the 7th, 2022. As you know, there is a difference between the calendars, the old and the new one. Uh, the Western world adopted the uh, reform calendar uh, imposed by the Popery, papacy, while the Eastern world has retained the old calendar. The question is, why was Christ not born in winter? I have, have I've had some feedback uh, with my previous message with some people saying that, you know, why should we not Christianize something that was paganism and celebrate the birth of the Messiah? Well, uh, let me give you straight away the good answer. The, the number one, in the, in the Bible, God of the Bible is very clear when he commands men to keep and to do something. We have his Ten Commandments, then also we have in Leviticus chapter 23, his appointed feasts, which are appointed for the men to keep them. Not the Israelites, it's for the whole humankind. Yes, originally it was given to, to Israelites, but we know that in the New Testament dispensation, God is working with all nations. Therefore, when he commands something, it is commanded with authority and with total clearance. When it comes to the birth of the Messiah... Do we have any command, either in the Old or in the New Testament, to keep it and celebrate it? No, obviously not. That's number one. Number two, it is well established in history that December 25th is actually the birth of the Sun God. And therefore, you cannot really... You can rename it, you can label it Christian, you can do with it whatever you want, but does it change the fact that it is the birthday of the sun god? The answer is no. You can call me an American, not a European, but does it make me an American? No, it does not. You can call uh, a cat a lion, but does it change the fact that it is a cat? No. So you can call a pagan festival Christian, or the, the uh, Christmas, or the birth of the Messiah, but does that change the origin, the nature, and the meaning of that festival? Obviously not. It's a common sense, my dear friends. It's just a common sense. And after all, if people are so keen to celebrate the birth of the Messiah because they say, well, this dying world does have a desperate need for the love of Jesus and so on, okay, I can understand that it's a sincere desire. And I, I do appreciate your sincerity. But again, a common sense says that you cannot, you know, by labeling something that it is not, change the nature and the origin of it. But fine, if you want to keep the celebrate, if you want to keep the birth of the Messiah, then why don't you keep it in the right season? The Messiah was not born in winter, you see. That's the whole problem. After all, celebrating birthday was a pagan custom which God never commanded Israelites to do. Well, have you found anywhere in the Bible that God commanded anyone to keep his or her birthday? No. He didn't command it to the Israelites. He did not command it to the prophets. He did not command it to the early church, which was established in Jerusalem, because it is a pagan custom. Even the uh, Catholic encyclopedia would admit that it was not celebrated, the birthdays were not celebrated by the original or primitive Christians. But then again, God did command the autumn or fall festivals, the holidays in which he is present, and they're sanctified by him. And sometimes in that season, in the autumn, or the fall, however you want to call it, Jesus Christ was born then. It is now established that he was most likely born around the Feast of Trumpets or around the Feast of Tabernacles. One way or the other, he was not born in winter. So keeping Christmas with all kinds of excuses defies not only the word of God, but also defies the common sense. And finally, if God did not command celebrating birthday of the Messiah, if he did not command that to, 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 to humankind, then the question is, who injected such an idea, such a custom, among humanity? If God is not the one who did it, then who who else did it? Well, obviously the enemy of God. Now, if you would turn to Luke chapter 2, verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, 
we read that, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So, you know, there is much evidence available that Jesus was born in the autumn or fall, not on December 25th. So if you want to keep really his birth, well, keeps it sometimes in the autumn, but I would uh, I would rather uh, uh, suggest to you that you should keep the uh, holidays around which he was born, the holidays, God's holidays around which he was born. He was not born in the winter. He was not born in the pagan winter festive season, dear friends. Now, of course, no one knows the exact date of Christ's birth. You see, doesn't that tell you something? God is very clear when he commands keeping his holidays. He gives us the exact dates. When it comes to the birth of the Messiah, if it was God's will to give us the exact date to celebrate it, he would have done it anyway. He didn't do it. Not only in the Old Testament, he never where he prophesied, where we have all the prophecies, prophecies all throughout the Old Testament about his coming and his birth. He didn't give us the exact birthday uh, and the day of, date of birth of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, and he did not do it in the New Testament either. So it appears that God does not want people to celebrate that event. But still, if you are still having your own excuses, if it is your will, not God's will, but your will, again, why do you keep pagan festive season label it Christian? Why don't you keep it his uh, birthday, even though we don't know the exact day, why don't you keep it in the fall? Why don't you keep it in the autumn when and where we have commanded God's holidays, and in that festive season he was indeed born? And one clue to the season of Christ's birth is found in Luke, again, chapter 2, verse 8, which says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now friends, the sheep were still, you see, in the fields at night. That would be impossible in winter, in any country. In those days, just like today, in many parts of the world, and the world, in, including the uh, including the continent where I live, which is Europe, in those days, the winters were more severe in the Holy Land with frequent snowfall. And flocks were kept in shelters from about mid-October to mid-March. And for details, you can see there is a note in Clark's commentary. Those of you who live in the Protestant world, well, Clark is a famous, Adam Clark is a famous commentary on the Bible. He made a note on Luke chapter 2 verse 8, and I'm going to quote it for you, but you can, you know, find it and check it for yourself. Here is the quote. There were shepherds abiding in the field. Adam Clark says, There is no intimation here that these shepherds were exposed to the open air. They dwelt in the fields where they had their sheep penned up, but they undoubtedly had tents or booths under which they dwelt. Then, keeping watch by night, Adam Clark comments, or, as in the margin, keeping the watches of the night, i.e., each one keeping a watch which ordinarily consisted of three hours in his turn. The reason why there was them in the field appears to have been either to preserve the sheep from beasts of prey, such as wolves, foxes, etc., or from freebooting banditti, with, with which all the land of Judea was at that time much infested. It was a custom among the Jews to send out their sheep to the deserts about the Passover and bring them home at the commencement of the first rain. During the time they were out, the shepherds watched them night and day. As the Passover occurred in the spring and the first rain began early in the month of Markishwan, which answers to part of our October and November, we find that the sheep were kept out in the open country during the whole of the summer. And as these shepherds had not yet brought home their flocks, it is presumptive argument that October had not yet commenced and that consequently our Lord was not born on 25th of December when no flocks were out in the fields nor could he have been born later than September as the flocks were still in the fields by night on this very ground the nativity in December should be given up says Adam Clark one of the most authoritative commentators on the Bible so you see Jesus Christ could not have been born later than December some people calculated it was around uh, September 11th when uh, that's about the time of the Feast of Trumpets, whether that be so or not, it doesn't matter. But again, again, if you, contrary to God's will, still want to celebrate the birth of the Messiah, why do you keep it in winter in December when he could not have been born later than September? Adam Clark adds, The feeding of the flocks by night in the field is a chronological fact which casts considerable light upon this disputed point. End of the quote. Now we have another clue. 
And that is the fact that John the, ba- John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus Christ. In the, again, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and verse 26 and 27, verse 26 says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Verse, uh, 20, uh, verse 36, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, the angel tells her, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. End of the quote. This is the Holy Scripture. This is the Bible, the Word of God. The only authority that can regulate a true Christian life. There is no other authority higher than that, dear friends. So Luke 1 verse 36. Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Mary conceived Jesus Christ. So we know that there is, there are like six months apart. So we know that John the Baptist was conceived about mid-June. He was conceived uh, conceived about mid-June because there was the certain turn uh, of those uh, shifts of the temple when when his father was in the, his shift and, 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 and there in the temple. He belong, belonged to a certain family of Levites and uh, even back in the Old Testament days it was King David who, who arranged uh, when and for how long each family of Levites would be present in the temple and uh, and uh, uh, executing its duty, temple duty for the people. So uh, it was about mid-June and therefore John the Baptist was born in late March because John's father Zechariah was serving in the temple during the priestly course of Abijah when the angel appeared to him in Luke chapter 1 verse 5. It says there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. So thus Jesus Christ's birth must have occurred in early autumn. Because they were six months apart. John was born in late March. Six. You add six months to that, you get early autumn. Now again, the course of Abijah, it was the, the Levite priesthood was divided into courses by King David and King David appointed how each course was to have its uh, 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 its uh, service, certain time of service at the temple, and they were just having different shifts. So at that time, the shift for the course of Abijah would be mid mid June. So again, do you want to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, at least if you still insist, contrary to the fact that we have no certain date and that the contrary to the fact that God did not command it. Well, why do you keep it then in winter? And again, the legitimate question is, if God did not allow Messiah to be born on December 25th, then who gives you or me or anybody else right to proclaim the nativity of the sun God as the birthday of the Messiah? Sun God. What is Sun God? It's sun worship. The whole Bible is infested with, well, the whole house of Israel is infested with sun worship, which included uh, sacrificing your own children to the sun God, Baal. That's what those festivities involved, human sacrifices. And God knows that. God knows what it means. And people say today, but you know, we, we just uh, change. We don't celebrate any paganism. We celebrate the birth of the Messiah. Well, how can you celebrate the birth of the Messiah when December 25th is the birth of sun god Baal? And when you have in the Bible the evidence that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was not born in December but in early autumn. Additional evidence is the fact that Jerusalem and the surrounding towns were very crowded with visitors at the time Jesus Christ was born. Because his parents, as you see, they had to take accommodations in a stable. Now, why would people flock into Jerusalem? Well, they would flock into Jerusalem when they had the uh, when there was a big holiday, biblical holiday, and then many people would flock into Jerusalem to keep biblical holiday. Usually, it was for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was also for the Pentecost, and also it was for the uh, Autumn Feast or the Fall Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, there we are. So we have another. So we have another uh, uh, another additional evidence that it was the fall, the autumn, not winter, because you know the autumn festivals occur in the seventh month of the sacred year. You have a record about that in Leviticus twenty three, verse twenty three. 
uh, we have, that's the uh, commandment about keeping the Feast of Trumpets. Then in Leviticus 23, verse 27, that's the Day of Atonement. It's all, they all fall in the fall or in the autumn. And Leviticus 23 and chapter 30, uh, chapter 23 and uh, verse 34 is the Feast of Tabernacles. And then in verse 36, you would find the last great day. And all of those uh, uh, holidays, which come at the time of the of autumn they all correspond to our september october season september october we learned from we read from adam clark that he could not have been born later than september now this was also the time of year when taxes were collected as you will find in luke chapter 2 verse 1 through 5 and we also find in luke chapter 2 verse 41 and john chapter 7 and first 10 verses that it was the custom for jesus parents to travel to jerusalem for the annual holidays and it was not only their custom it was a custom of all the nations so the old nation basically flocked to jerusalem for the annual holidays that fell in the autumn and right there in that festive season of the holidays commanded by the Eternal, Jesus Christ was born. So we have convincing proofs that Jesus was born in the early autumn, not in the dead of winter when the pagans celebrated the birth of their son God. And there is no biblical authority for the celebration of Christmas as supposed birthday of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And again, you might say, but, but you know, we, we, we just made it. Well, you made it. But it's your human authority. You made it the, the, the birthday of Jesus Christ. But it's not God's authority that made it. God never gave us the precise date when he was born. But he gave us the season. He gave us exactly to know the season. The season was fall or the autumn. And the season was his sanctified festivals. Not pagan festivities. And you know that after the uh, fall festivals, after the fall holidays of God... There comes a winter period when there is no any celebration commanded by the Eternal. And then only in the spring, starting with uh, Abib the 14th, starts the first festival, festival season. It starts the, it's the, uh, called the Passover and also the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but it starts in the spring. So in the winter, God did not command any celebration. He did not appoint any holy holiday, any holy feast for people, his people to keep it. Now the largest religious cult, which fostered the celebration of December 25th as a holiday throughout the Greco-Roman world, was pagan sun worship. It was Mithraism. And the chief de deity in this religion is the sun goddess, the oriental goddess of the heavens called the Queen of Heaven. You find her in Jeremiah chapter 7. The season of the year when this goddess received her greatest adoration from the pagans was at the time of the winter solstice in December. The winter festival was called the Nativity of the Sun, not the Nativity of, of the Messiah. Again, the Messiah was born in early autumn, in early fall. So if you want to keep his birthday, well, try to determine the exact date if you can. And even if you cannot, if you still insist, contrary to God's will, to keep it, well, keep it in the autumn then. But I would suggest again, why don't you keep the holidays that he commanded in that very season? He commanded his festivals to be kept in the fall. He made no appointment of any festival in the winter. So why do you, why do you insist on winter and why do you insist to uh, celebrate something that is established, proven, completely pagan satanic holiday birth of the nativity of the sun seer james fraser in his work on ancient religion the golden bow here is a quote from his work uh this is saint martin's edition pages 47 471 472 he says an instructive relic of the long struggle between christianity and mithraism is pre preserved in our festival of christmas which the church seems to have borrowed directly from its heathen rival in the julian calendar the 25th of december was regarded as the nativity of the sun the ritual of the nativity as appears to have been celebrated in syria and egypt was remarkable the celebrants retired into certain inner shrines, from which at midnight they issued with a loud cry, The Virgin has brought forth, the light is waxing. The Egyptians even represented the newborn sun by the image of an infant which, on his birthday, the winter solstice, they brought forth and exhibited to his worshippers. Well, this just uh, looks like a, almost like a spittled image of what the... No, it's a completely spittled image of what Vatican does every single year. 
So the New Testament, we're speaking about the New Testament. I'm not, you see, I'm not even referring about the old, to the Old Testament. Yes, the holidays were commanded in the Old Testament, but nevertheless, the early, the primitive church kept those holidays in the New Testament. You find the church in the book of Acts, you find the, the early church after being established in Jerusalem, you find the early church celebrating each one of those holidays. The only holiday which does not appear in the New Testament is the Feast of Trumpets. However, we know from the book of Revelation that the trumpets represent the uh, war cry and the announcement of the return of our Messiah. So if he's going to return on the feast, at the Feast of Trumpets, then, well, we can... <laughs> We can speculate, because the Feast of Trumpets comes in early autumn, we can speculate that perhaps, very likely, he was born on that very day or somewhere around that day. But he was certainly born in that festival season of God's holidays. Not He was not born in uh, the winter pagan holidays that celebrate the sun god and, 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 and are kept, kept at, uh, at uh, equinoxes and they just follow these, 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 these heavenly bodies. Heavenly bodies, of course. Pagans worship heavenly bodies. Sun, moon, stars, planets. True Christians are never commanded to worship heavenly hosts. Never. Never, never in the Bible. Not even in the New Testament. And the New Testament proves that, that Christ was not born in winter. Because the Gospels say nothing as to the day of Christ's birth. It, it, and if it was God's will for the followers of Christ to celebrate his birthday, God surely would have told his people when it was. But you see, the early Christians, again, as I told you a while ago, did not keep birthdays. The only two instances of birthday celebration in the Bible refer to evil people, godless people, heathens. In Genesis 40, verse 20, there was a murder as Pharaoh celebrated his birthday. In Matthew 14, verse 6 to 10, Herod's birthday party culminated with the beheading of John the Baptist. So the early Christians understood that only the heathen celebrated their birthdays in Bible times. And therefore, the early church never observed the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And here is now the Catholic Encyclopedia. And the Catholic, as you know, have this, all these uh, Egyptian customs that we just read uh, a minute ago. They have these Egyptian customs that they, which they practice even to this day. The Catholic Encyclopedia, this is... Uh, edition 1908, volume 3, page 724, under the, uh, under the, uh, article Christmas, the Catholic Encyclopedia clearly says, in the scripture, sinners alone, not saints, celebrate their birthdays. End of the quote. So the Bible clearly reveals that Christ's birth was nowhere near December 25th. And Christ began his ministry just as he was approaching 30 years of age. Luke chapter 3 verse 23, it says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. So this was the age required for a priest in the Old Testament before he could be installed as official preacher. Uh, that instruction we find in Numbers chapter 4 verse 3. And the Jews also considered that 30 years was the age of maturity. Now since Christ was just about 30 years old when he began his ministry in early autumn, A.D. 27, that means that he was born in the early autumn of 4 B.C., 30 years before. If he was born in spring or summer of, four, of the year 4 B.C., he would have been past 30 at the beginning of his ministry. But the scripture says, as we have just read, that he was about or approaching 30. If he was born in the winter of 4 uh, to 3 BC, so that winter, you know, between 4, four year uh, or in the third year before Christ, then he could have been under 30 when he began preaching. And winter birth is out of the question because the flocks were still in the fields at the time of Christ's birth. Add to all of that that we have in Matthew 24 verse 20, a reference to winters in the promised land. These are the words of the very Messiah. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. You see, and therefore early autumn 4 BC is the only conceivable period in which Christ could have been born. Now in the Old Testament times when the 12 tribes of Israel were united, King David had divided the Aaronic priesthood into 24 courses. I just referred to that a while ago. So David instituted that each course should serve in the sanctuary for one week. And these 24 courses 
of the priesthood are described exactly in First Chronicles chapter 24. You have it all well in detail. And all that tradition that King David established also continued in the times, to the times of the time when Jesus Christ was born and when he lived in, in his human in his human flesh, when he lived in flesh, when he, he lived his human life among us. Josephus, the famous author, he lived during the time of the Apostle Paul, and he himself was a priest. He tells us in his book Antiquities, uh, chapter 7, uh, paragraph 14, uh, no, that will be chapter, that will be uh, Antiquities, book number 7, it will be uh, 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 chapter 14 and paragraph 7, he tells us that each course of those 24 served for one week, from Sabbath to Sabbath, you see. And that was the case with the father of John the Baptist. His father, so John the Baptist's father served in his course for one week when Gabriel, the angel, appeared to him and told him, your wife will conceive and you will have a son. Also Jewish Talmud, which is just the uh, source for the Jewish... Uh, Religion, the Talmud, informs us that each course served twice in the year. And the first course would begin its service in the spring, on the first week of the sacred year, it was the month Abib, and the second would follow the second week, etc., and this went on until the 24th course had served. Thus, on each of the 28 weeks during the year, one particular course of the priests served in the temple. Now, added to these 48 weeks are three extra weeks in the year. Now, the three major biblical holidays, or rather, three major holiday seasons, were the three additional weeks when all 24 courses served together, you see. They would all come together in those three additional weeks. It would be the Passover in the beginning of, the, of spring, it would be the Pentecost in late spring, and it was the Feast of Tabernacles in the early autumn, when multitudes of people observed these festivals in Jerusalem. Exactly, they would flock to Jerusalem, just like Jesus Christ's parents flocked to Jerusalem, and he was born right there in the autumn festive season. The Talmud tells us about uh, those three major biblical holy seasons with the additional, with those three additional weeks when all those 24 courses of the priests served together is Talmud in the uh, uh, section Sukkah 55b. So you see, the 51 weeks of the Hebrew calendar are accounted for. Now occasionally, as you probably know, or some of you might know, a 13th month was added to the calendar to allow the months to remain in their proper seasons of the year. When this extra month was added, the priests who officiated in the, in the 12th month repeated their service in the 13th month. That's also, uh, that also is an information that we have from Talmud, section Megillah uh, 6b. Now again, in the days of Christ... The 24 courses of Aaronic priesthood continued to serve in the temple at Jerusalem. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Zechariah was performing his service in the temple when Angel Gabriel brought him good news. Elizabeth, who was quite advanced in years, was going to conceive and bear a son whose name was to be John. Now we must notice the time of the year when Zechariah received this information. Please notice it, Luke chapter 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Ab Abijah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So Zechariah was serving in the temple in the course of Abijah. And then it continues, and it came to pass, verse 8, and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. That's verse 8 and verse 9. So all we need is check First Chronicles chapter 24 verse 10 to find out which in order was the course of Abijah. It was the eighth in order. We are informed in First Chronicles chapter 24, which means that Zechariah was ministering in the ninth week after the beginning of God's first month, Abib. And it was the ninth week and not the eighth week for the simple reason that the spring Passover season always occurs in the first month in God's sacred calendar and during the third week. So since all 24 courses served during that particular week, 
This means that Zechariah officiated during the ninth week after the beginning of Abib, the first month in spring. Now Zechariah served in the fifth year before Christ. The first day of Abib in this year was a Sabbath, the day on which the first priestly course began its service. And this day on the Roman calendar was April the 6th. Thus, Zechariah, who served in the ninth week, was serving from the Hebrew month Er 27 to the Hebrew month, month Sivan 5th, which would be corresponding to our June the 1st to June the 8th. And in that week, he was told that his wife was going to conceive a son. However, Zechariah by no means was able to return home immediately after the ninth week because the first day of the next week was a holiday week. It was a holiday week, week and it was Pentecost. And Pentecost was a pilgrimage holiday, just like was the Passover, just like it was the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the... Uh, so it was a pilgrimage holiday when multitudes of observing believers flocked into Jerusalem. And therefore, Zechariah had to remain for one more week with the other 23 priestly courses and serve in the temple. So this additional duty kept him in Jerusalem until Sivan the 12th, corresponding to June 15th, when he was free to return to his home as the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 23 confirms, when we read verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Now Zechariah returned home immediately after his service in the temple, and then his wife conceived, verse 24. Now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now this would have occurred the first week after he returned from Jerusalem. So Elizabeth conceived sometime immediately after Pentecost week, which was from Sivan 12th to Sivan 19th. That would be corresponding to our calendar. That would be mid-June. Now mid-June in 5 BC and nine months is about the first day of Abib, March 27th. Nine months later, it was 4 BC when John the Baptist was born. It could not have been in a later year because Herod was already dead before the spring of 3 BC. And thus, John the Baptist was born in the spring of 4 BC. The Gospel tells us that Christ was six months younger than John the Baptist. We read it in Luke, and I'll just remind you, it's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26, 27, and verse 36. Now, adding those six months to the time of John's birth which was the first of Abib, we arrive to about the first of Ethanim, also called Tishri, which was the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar, or we basically arrive near mid-September on our Roman calendar. Mid-September, that is when the Messiah was born. So if you want to keep the birth of Messiah, you cannot keep it in December and name the birthday of Sun God, name it and 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 and. and label it and rename it and say, oh, this is the birth of the Messiah. No, it is not. And that's how we understand, based on all of this information in the New Testament, that Christ was born in the autumn, not in the winter. And another fact is also interesting, as recorded in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, at first five verses. Joseph and Mary went to Galilee, uh, sorry, they went from Galilee to Bethlehem. So they went to Bethlehem from Galilee to be taxed. Now, the Roman regulations on taxation required that only the head of the house was to be present. Now, that would be Joseph. Mary accompanied Joseph even though she was not required by the Roman law to be present. Now, why did she go? Well, because the Roman taxation that year coincided with the end of the agricultural year when the Jews collected tithes on agricultural produce. It was early autumn, just before the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was customary to pay tithes on agricultural products at the end of the harvest. The civil year for tithes and taxes was reckoned from early autumn to early autumn. So in ancient Judea, the agricultural or civil year ended and began on the first day of the seventh month in Hebrew calendar, in early autumn, that was the month of Ethanim, also called Tishri. Now, various scholars assume that this 
particular taxation in 4 BC was decreed by Augustus Caesar, the Roman emperor, who is mentioned indeed in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. They think that census must have been conducted in the Roman manner, regardless of the Jewish laws. However, my dear friends, the historical fact is that at the time of this taxing, Judea was a protectorate of Rome. And the Romans did not directly tax the people. They actually were receiving tribute from Herod, whom they allowed to gather the taxes as he saw fit. And Herod was, of course, endeavoring to follow the customary laws of the Jews. So this particular taxation, which the Bible indicates occurred in 4 BC, was conducted in accordance with the Jewish laws and the Jewish customs. You can read about it and read about that in Encyclopedia Biblica, columns 3994 through 3996. In any case, the taxation was carried out as it was common for the Jews. It was very near the first of Ethanim, the early autumn, at the ending of the civil year in the promised land. So Joseph and Mary had gone to Bethlehem at the beginning of the Hebrew seventh month of Ethanim. Jerusalem and all the immediate towns were filled with people who had come to observe the holidays, God's holidays in this seventh month. Again, those holidays were the first uh, the first day of uh, Nethany was the Feast of Tabernacles. The 15th day of, Neth- of Ethany was the Day of Atonement. And the 21st day of Ethany was the Feast of Tabernacle. So that is why you see Mary accompanied Joseph to keep God's ordained feast because she was a pious woman and faithful to her Creator. And it was customary for Joseph and Mary to go to Jerusalem for the Holy Festivals. It was their custom, you can read about that in Luke chapter 2 verse 41, and it is also mentioned in the Gospel of John chapter 7 and uh, verse 1 through 10. Besides, Joseph did not want to leave his wife home alone since he had to go to pay taxes and then observe the autumn feast in Jerusalem as they came to Bethlehem to observe the feast in the early autumn. Christ, the Lamb of God, came to this world again in the early autumn. That's the truth about the birth of Jesus Christ. There is no other truth, there is no alternate truth, and no matter how much people have all kinds of reasoning and try to label a pagan holiday the birthday of the Messiah, it does not work. You can, uh, you know, give name, whatever name you want to a wrong date, and it does not change the nature, the origin, and the facts. The proven facts is that December 25th is the birthday of the Son God. Jesus Christ was born in early autumn. That's established by the Bible and by all the historical data and facts that we have recorded in the history. That is the only truth that is out there. Jesus Christ, no, he was not born in the winter.